Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good, uh, good, good morning uh, if you're in Europe. Uh, welcome to this uh, episode of the Quantitative History Webinar Series. So today we are very happy to have uh, Professor uh, York Barton uh, from the University of uh, Tübingen in Germany. Uh, so Professor Barton is a German uh, economic historian, is uh, the former president of the European Historical Economics Society, current co-editor-in-chief of Economics and Human Biology, and is also currently a chair professor of economic history, as I mentioned, uh, at the University of uh, Dubingen. So his research areas are very extensive, uh, including the development of prosperity and growth of economies worldwide, long-term development of education and human capital from a global perspective, and determinants and effects of interpersonal violence. So today uh, he's gonna speak on uh, state capacity, security and welfare in the ancient Middle East and China. 12,000 to 400 uh, BCE. So this is a, a very, very long time period. So usually I guess uh, our webinar speakers uh, either cover uh, modern history or uh, medieval history. So today we're gonna uh, extend that uh, time horizon much further back. Uh, so, uh, uh, so today uh, after Professor Button's presentation, uh, we have as uh, our invited discussant, uh, Michael Ramira. Uh, so he is currently uh, a fellow at the University of Hong Kong teaching uh, archaeology. So he got his uh, PhD in archaeology uh, from uh, Cambridge University. Uh, so again, uh, just uh, to remind everyone, um, the format for today's uh, webinar will be that uh, Professor Barton will speak for about one hour, followed by a 15 minute or so discussion by uh, uh, Dr. Rivera. And then we will move on to uh, the Q&A uh, uh, part. Uh, so for which I will read out uh, questions, comments uh, from you guys. So again, uh, during the uh, presentation and discussion, uh, please post uh, any questions and comments you may have in the uh, Q&A box. So later I will read out uh, from uh, you, your questions. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Button. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... Thank you very much for the very nice introduction. Can you see the full screen? Um, uh, not yet. Not yet. That's why. I, also... oh, I can. I can see. I can see it. Okay. Uh, it's not full screen. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Why is oh. that? Let me try it again. No. Yeah, um, I'm very happy to be here and uh, thank you very much again for the nice invitation and the nice uh, welcoming work, uh, words, Professor Chen. Um, so this is a paper about the very long run, especially in the ancient Middle East, looking at state capacity, security and welfare. And we will throw a first glance on a new project on China. This is joint work with Giacomo Benati, Arkadiusz Sovtisiak, um, Alessandra Tagini on the Middle Eastern uh, study, and then on the China part, Chiao Fan, Sun Chiao Fan and Wang Chiang have contributed a lot jointly with many other colleagues. You see here on the right side the excavation of Uruk, 
nicely um, illustrated by the sun rising uh, on the horizon. Um, so this is what we will focus on the rise of the first states. We will take a look at whether um, these first states had a strong impact on the human behavior in terms of violence, whether this increased violence or whether perhaps the first states managed to convince their uh, members to be less violent. Um, and one important role for the Middle East in particular is played by Inanna, the goddess on the left-hand side, later also adapted as Ishtar by the um, Assyrian culture. Um, so this was a goddess both of love and war, and it is very much the city goddess of Uruk, um, who had a very strong influence on how people thought about how a state should be. She's a very ambivalent goddess, uh, given that she was both uh, responsible for love and for war, and she has female and also male attributes. So this ambivalence will be very present in the following presentation, as you will see in a minute. So the structure of today's presentation is, um, as we are aiming at expanding economic history back to the beginning of civilization and the first states, we need first to talk a little bit about the methods. Um, how can we actually measure welfare, especially health and nutrition? And nutrition accounted for a large share of the total income. Uh, and how can we measure violence in a very long run? framework. Then we will uh, turn to the main part of the paper, the ancient Middle East, and discuss how these first states um, were developing, whether there were some evidence for security um, state capacity, so that the state could limit interpersonal violence. We will look at cranial trauma and weapon wounds, for example, as an indicator for that. Um, and we will assess whether this has a strong impact on early nutritional welfare as well. And then in the last and third section, we will take a brief glance on the China project and that we are just starting. Actually, it's more an all Asia project, but I can show you some first results on China, uh, how health and nutrition developed over the last 10,000 years. Um, we can also say something about gender equality and sun bias. But first, on the indicators. What will we use in the following? We will look at human stature or height, which is actually mostly based on the long bones, the femur, um, and its length, um, which is a relatively close correlate to human stature. And by itself, it's also a quality of better or worse nutrition and health. Similar measure um, in terms of the economic interpretation is so-called linear animal hypoplasia. So these are horizontal lines on the teeth um, that can also be interpreted as stress. And we will see that it's especially correlated with malnutrition and poor health. Um, derived from these two measures, we will look at gender equality of height to see whether some of the societies have relatively taller men or women. I will speak about that in more detail in a minute. And then um, as a main correlate of this, we will look at cranial trauma and weapon wounds to measure interpersonal violence. So first on the human stature or height, of course, we um, all know that there's a strong genetic impact at the individual level. So if you have tall parents, then you probably are also a bit taller. But interestingly, the limits of the influence on the population level, if you average many hundreds of individuals of a population living in a given period, is much less strong um, and there is a much stronger impact of nutrition and disease on height. So therefore, um, traditionally, height is used as an 
indicator of the quality of nutrition and the um, absence of disease, especially protein rich food turned out to be a bottleneck factor for early societies. Starchy grains tend to be available more often and also vegetables and so on. So the and ironically, the diet that is healthy for us today, eating a lot of vegetables, fruits and so on, not much uh, protein rich food, especially not animal protein, that was not such a, a healthy diet for the ancient populations because they were at a much lower level of development. Um, development economists are using height, in, especially as children's stunting, so the share of short children as an indicator, and economic historians have also used it very much since uh, Robert Fogel's um, strong influence. Recently, it was used um, for very long run um, economic history. Uh, Richard Steckel and his cooperators have established this. Nicola Köpke played a strong role in this, Eva Rosenstock, to uh, uh, combine this with statistical or econometric, as we call it, methods to assess the millennium wrong um, time frame. There were also studies by Willem Jongman, uh, Kalesh Bosch, and Francis Rothenbluth. Recently, there's a very important study in PNAS uh, from Stock et al. I will uh, mention that later again. And Ji Wu Chen also uh, has a very interesting approach in this uh, area. So why is height interesting? First of all, we can fill a lot of white spots um, and uh, assess the development and time periods and regions where we have no other information. Secondly, height is also interesting because it's so closely correlated with life expectancy. There are some exceptions, Japan in the 20th century, for example. Um, for example, many people looked at the relative risk of dying and compared that with height. And using many different samples, they found that the taller historical populations tend to have a slightly lower relative risk of dying in the next period. So if you look up your own height here and you get worried, don't be worried. This is only um, informative at a large population level. If there are hundreds of thousands of individuals assessed, there's a lot of individual variation. So that's not in any way deterministic at the individual level. But you can see that even Norway in the 1960s and 70s had these so-called Vala curves, um, where we can see this relationship between height and the mortality record. Um, we looked at heights in the last 200 years to also check whether the genetic factor at the population level has a strong influence. Here you can see um, eight, uh, nine different world regions, um, which we assessed. And we estimated that actually, while we have a and quite a strong variation uh, for the birth decade of the 1980s, so the people who are in their adult years now, um, we have actually very similar heights of most world regions in the middle of the 19th century. So uh, we are all uh, the same uh, in terms of our 19th century height record, whether we look at East Asia or Western Europe or Eastern Europe, all are roughly in the range of 165, 166 centimeters. Those are males. The only exception was um, North America, Australia, New Zealand had taller heights, a very um, good endowment with uh, proteins. The tallest, according to Rick Steckel, were the American Indians in North America. And we have relatively short heights in Southeast Asia and also South Asia, where the protein consumption was also relatively low in most regions. So, but the message here is that we can use height um, um, because we think that the genetic factor has probably a role, but a very small role. Um, then we take linear animal hypoplasia as a comparison because it's always 
nice to have uh, similar uh, indicators on related phenomena so that we can compare the trends of nutrition and health in case there are measurement errors or measurement issues and there are always measurement issues so what are these linear animal hypoplasia these are horizontal lines on the teeth which can be counted by archaeologists who are excavating human bones um, and we can calculate the share of um, persons who are affected by this um, linear animal hypoplasia. In the literature, a lot of different potential reasons are mentioned, including psychological stress and so on. But um, looking at the record that we have so far, we always find a very strong correlation with other malnutrition and disease indicators. So this suggests that this is really an indicator for malnutrition and disease mostly, and then there are some additional impacts. Um, looking at the European record of the last 2000 years, as an example, that we can compare later on with a Chinese record, for example, um, we see that in the pre-medieval period, so uh, what we can also call Roman antiquity, we observe a modest height level, femur length and height uh, is almost the same. Um, there are conversion formulas, there's a lot of debate among anthropologists, which one to use exactly, this one we can discuss later perhaps. Um, so the Roman antiquity pre-medieval period had a relatively low heights, but then the early medieval period roughly from 500 common era to 1000 common era had a much higher nutrition and health according to this indicator interpretation. Um, also, the hypoplasia was relatively high, but since then there was an almost continuous decline in animal hypoplasia absence. Um, this is positively formulated as absence of linear animal hypoplasia of the height record or the femur length and of the dental health, which is another related indicator. So this correlation between these three indicators suggests that they are relatively informative health and nutrition indicators. Our third indicator is derived from these. We take the ratio of height. Uh, we do not take the gap because then we would need to control for the average height level. Can also take the ratio of linear animal hypoplasia as an indicator of how girls are treated versus boys. Both height and linear animal hypoplasia are most sensitive in the period roughly after weaning up to the years uh, three or four or five, uh, linear animal hypoplasia even here in the sixth year. Um, so they measure really how the societies are treating, in this case, boys and girls of these young ages, whether they receive high quality um, food and whether they are taken care of when they are ill. So we can um, use this as an indicator. Of course, there's a biological difference between males and females, obviously, but there's also a certain range of um, nutritionally determined height differences. We can compare that, for example, with life expectancies in the 20th century. Here you can see the Asian uh, gender inequality of life expectancy and the gender inequality of height. Uh, the gender inequality of life expectancy is simply the difference between male and female or female and male life expectancy. So, for example, in um, Bangladesh and in India, we have in the birth decade of the 1960s, two more years of life expectancy for males, according to UN statistics. Um, whereas, for example, in Singapore or Bhutan, we have a much longer life for females already for the birth decade of the 1960s. And the same is true basically for the gender inequality of height. In Singapore, males and females are a bit more similar in terms of their human stature. And the same is true for Bhutan, whereas, for example, in Bangladesh and India, 
males and females are quite diverse in terms of their height for this birth decade. And this applies also to many of the other countries, Nepal, Pakistan, Malaysia, uh, Korea, Thailand. A little bit of an outlier is China here, where the um, um, gender inequality of life expectancy and the gender inequality of height is a bit different. Uh, the gender inequality of height is relatively a bit lower, especially in northern China. And on the other hand, Japan and Sri Lanka are other outliers, more similar um, uh, in terms of life expectancy. But in general, we can um, compare this with other indicators and we find that the difference of height is also telling us, the ratio of height actually is telling us something about the gender equality. Also for the uh, Europe in the last 2000 years, we can distinguish a lot of different places and time periods, and we see also positive correlation between the um, ratio of height or femur length and the ratio of the linear animal hypoplasia, this other malnutrition and health signal. If we take the ratio between males and females of this one, it's similar to the ratio of females and males of height. And finally, indicator four is the share of cranial trauma and weapon wounds. So um, we can identify from the human bones whether um, a lot of people had a very severe um, trauma on the head because somebody was hitting on the head and people died or did not die in some cases. Uh, if the hit was not so strong, and we can calculate the ratio of people who had this trauma, violence, trauma signal, and we can also observe sometimes weapon wounds like an arrowhead sticking in a bone somewhere. Taking these two together, um, we calculated for the last 2000 years the European share for males and for females. Again, the pre-medieval or Roman antiquity period, early medieval, um, we observe that violence was relatively high um, in a joint paper with Rick Steckel uh, up to the late medieval period, both for males and especially for, uh, sorry, especially for males. Um, only then things turned better in the early modern period. So the 16th to 18th century, and the industrial period, the 19th century, violence was getting lower and lower according to this share of people who had cranial trauma or weapon wounds. We can compare this indicator because it covers only a part of the possible causes of death, of course. Not everybody died um, from hitting on a hat um, because some people were also stabbed with a dagger or so. We can compare this with other indicators such as overall homicide or the pilling of kings, so-called regicide indicator. And again, we observe that it remains relatively high up to the 14th, 15th century, the late medieval period, and only then things turned better and also the homicide and regicide indicator turned downwards. So there is a certain correspondence between these archaeological cranial trauma shares and other share, um, indicators that we have for later periods. Um, of course, there are many challenges. Um, we need to discuss very much the representativeness or selectivity, which is the opposite of representativeness. Um, I will uh, leave this mainly for the discussion, as well as the osteological paradox, the uh, thing that sometimes societies appear uh, less healthy because people live relatively long lives and can accumulate, um, for example, trauma or other health problems um, with the spine or so. Um, then sample sizes are a big issue. We need to have large samples to uh, average out individual variation. And also the standardization of measurement is difficult because many different people worked on these indicators and not everybody was using exactly the same concept of measurement.
but um, meet, we can meet all these challenges in the written version of this paper, actually 80% of the effort are spent on these issues, especially the representativeness issue. Um, here I want to present you the nicest and most interesting part, um, like the major trends of nutrition and health, gender inequality and violence for early periods. So coming to the second part, um, we want to assess the violence and the state capability for the ancient Middle East. Um, we want to assess whether this was related with nutritional welfare, and we can imagine different pathways and different causal directions, like growing state capability could reduce the um, violence level, and then the production could increase because people would invest more um, in human capital and also in physical capital. But it might also be that better nutrition resulted in lower violence and higher state capacity or a bidirectional mechanism. So there is a lot of debate about state capabilities and their role in economic development. Um, for the last 20 years or so, I think most economies were very critical of state capabilities and the role of the state, uh, especially for the early periods, whether they were more extractive, whether they um, discriminated women in the uh, labor market and so on. Also for the archaeological period, Rosenstock and McMahon argued that the heavy taxation requirements were very bad for economic development. Um, but there are also contrasting views, people who um, basically stress the role of the state, like Mark Dinceco, Patrick O'Brien, and um, many other colleagues who said that the state would provide, even if the state was very imperfect and also had a lot of military interests, but still some of the public goods could be beneficial, especially in the later period. So we want to assess this role of the state. A bit related to this is our, the work with um, Tom Keywood about elite violence in the last 2000 years. Um, this uh, work argued that the reduction of violence led to a very strong economic development in Europe in the last 2000 years by measuring the killing of rulers as an indicator. Um, here we present evidence on the ancient Middle East, namely Mesopotamia, uh, modern day Iraq and the east of Syria, the Levant, which is the west of Syria, today's Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and we have data on Anatolia, today's Turkey and Iran, for six different time periods, which I will characterize in the following briefly. The regional distribution of the sample is very wide, so we have um, sites from many different places, thanks to my co-authors, Akadio Sovtisiak and uh, Giacomo Bernati, um, who excavated many of these sites and who um, well, are very knowledgeable in uh, putting all these data set together. The representativeness, of course, is an issue, but for the regions, I think we are doing pretty well. We will, we have looked a lot at the survivor bias of bones, whether only certain bones um, were considered, for example, um, or survived because of soil quality differences, very acidic soils uh, destroy a lot of bones. Um, so this is something that we took into account and that we could um, sort out. Then anthropologists sit, uh, spend a lot of work on the difference between pre-mortal, before death, during death, perimortal and post-mortal uh, differences. And we are interested only in the pre-mortal and perimortal. Why post-mortal? Well, for example, if there was a conflict, then sometimes people were so much um, opposed to their enemies that uh, even after they killed them already, they wanted to stick them again on the battlefield. And there are also some post-mortal trauma signs, for example. 
Then we discussed that some of causes of death do not leave marks on the bones. Therefore, we compared homicide and regicide for the overlapping period, and we find that the two are quite closely related. And then, of course, we need to differentiate between violent trauma and accidents. So we inserted a lot of CIS knowledge into this study of um, bioarchaeological economic history, for example, using the head brimline rule. If you imagine a head brimline um, around the head, then the uh, CIS expert pathologists um, they found that it's much more likely to be vi a violent cranial trauma if it's above the head rim line, and uh, it's more often an accident if it's below the head rim line. So if you're falling down, then you're more often falling on the nose or on uh, some lower parts of your skull. So taking all these into account, we can construct these trends. Just briefly on the background of these six different periods, uh, the Neolithic period before 4500 BCE was a period of low population density and not much social stratification. We would expect for in this period uh, a relatively low violence because of the low population density. Basically, people could not get so much into each other's way. Um, although there was, of course, also violence that was a older debate, um, but where there was also a limited um, exchange in trade, mostly chipped stones, obsidian, and so on. Then the Calcolytics saw the rise of the first cities. So this is where the action starts and where things get uh, complicated. Societies get very unequal. Sometimes the local re rulers exploit um, the surrounding uh, inhabitants. Um, the first centralized leader starts to uh, develop, and we would expect that in this period we might have a lot of conflict and also maybe less health and less nutrition. There was some uh, trade beginning, but it was mainly, mainly goods for elite consumption. Then the early Bronze Age changed things quite a bit. The, States get more mature, more experienced. They are also better at settling conflicts. The first legal systems developed um, even for non-elite groups. Well, at least not the highest, the ruler group. There are some legal remedies. Um, and there's also the first attempt at legal codes in the early Bronze Age and further develop in the Middle Bronze Age. So those two were basically a little bit like the Golden Age of Mesopotamia and the surrounding ancient Middle East. Um, Bajamovic et al. argued that this was the trade revolution period and um, even property rights for non-elites expanded. However, things do not run smoothly for an expanded period of time, although these were many centuries. Uh, with the late Bronze Age, um, there are beginning cloudy um, uh, situations. There's uh, first a rise of powerful Levantine states, but then a lot of famine, conflict, mass migration on these things, which um, led also to the dissolution of the palace-based system in the Levant, and also a lot of conflict and uh, lower agricultural production in Mesopotamia. And this was continued in the early Iron Age, also often termed and described as a Dark Age. Um, um, there was the invasion of the Sea People. People discussed whether this was really such a strong um, factor, but still it was there. Um, and only then thereafter, there were these large empires arising like the new Assyrian Empire and the Persian Empire and so on. Altogether, the uh, focus of development shifted a bit to the Mediterranean, uh, the Greek, the, the Phoenician, later the Roman period during the Iron Age. So for the ancient Middle East, we would expect in this last two periods, the Late Bronze and the Iron Age, uh, more conflict and less agricultural production per capita, um, so more an age of 
a conflict and crisis. Our number of cases are more than 3,500 for the animal hypoplasia data set for the four different regions that we can cover. And um, for the six different periods, you can see that, for example, for the late bronze, we have a bit less number of cases and some of the regions are missing, but still it's a reasonable coverage and it's the largest sample that was ever collected for this region and this time frame. So here are the first trends that we estimate for violence. We can see that, in fact, in the Neolithic, uh, when population density was low, uh, violence was also relatively low, uh, roughly between 0 and 10 or 11 percent of our skeletons in the four different regions had um, these violence signals on their skulls and the weapon wounds sticking somewhere in the bones. Then when Inanna came into play, the Calcolytic, Uruk and the first cities, first there was the strong increase in violence in many of these regions. So this was the period when the states were not experienced yet. Um, that changed in the early Bronze Age and especially in the middle Bronze Age when these Mesopotamia, Levant, Iran and Anatolia states managed to reduce interpersonal violence as measured by the uh, trauma on the skull. And then in the late Bronze and Iron Age, it seems that there was a certain increase again in violence. So this already contradicts a bit the view that there was a continuous decline in violence over the millennia. So we have a lot of historical action taking place. We have a lot of states being active um, in settling this. And then the other side of the equation, the animal hypoplasia or malnutrition and poor health. Again, we see a strong increase in malnutrition from the Neolithic to the Calcolithic, the Copper Age, uh, when the first states appeared. So there was an initial problem, but then um, during the early bronze and the mid bronze, most of these states managed to uh, uh, reduce malnutrition and otherwise improve nutrition, um, except for Anatolia and Mesopotamia, especially Mesopotamia was very densely settled, settled in this period, so there was also some population pressure, although the, the uh, views are divided about that. And then in the late bronze and the Iron Age, um, there was a strong increase in malnutrition and poor health again. So again, also in terms of living standards, nutrition and health, we see a lot of different developments, not just a, a unilinear uh, downward or upward trend over this millennia. We can do a regression analysis. Um, I will not go into the details here just to check whether this is statistically significant. Yes, there is a statistically significant correspondence between violence and malnutrition, although the number of cases is not very large, admittedly 35, we would like to have more, but these are averages of the 3,500 underlying cases. And we can also control for regional differences, time differences, population pressure effects, and we also coded the political hierarchy to see whether this uh, invalidates the violence factor, which it does not, but it increases to the explanatory power. Um, looking at the individual cases, uh, we aggregated the time period and region. Here for this figure, we see that Iran in the Calcolytic period, the second and the beginning of the city-states, um, had a very high violence level and a very high uh, malnutrition level. And on the other side, during the Neolithic and the Middle Bronze Age in particular, we have a low violence and a relatively low malnutrition level for many of these uh, region and time period cases that we show in this figure. So the conclusion of this section two would be that the state capacities were important. It seems that they helped in the early and mid-Bronze Age to reduce 
violence once the states had collected some experience over time that was not the case in the very first city states in the calcolytic and uh, we can imagine three possible causal pathways um, security allows income to grow shorts towards um, kind of development um, in which the state allows via for example legal tools or also cults to uh, um, generate more um, problem solving possibilities then we have less uh, violence and we have more um, income and better nutrition um, or it could be that the income and nutrition uh, leads to better institutions reducing interpersonal violence and of course we can also imagine a bidirectional mechanism that resulted in a co-evolution of the two so um now we turn to the third and shorter part of our project um we want to assess Asia and we started with China for obvious reasons um this is a new frontier project with a lot of colleagues 30 to 40 colleagues and sorry that I cannot mention all of you in case you are listening um we want to know how violence health nutrition and welfare developed in China and in Asia this was initiated by Wang Qian from Texas A&M University um, as part of the Global History of Health project, originally uh, initiated by Rick Steckel um, and many others, including Charlotte Roberts, Clark Larsons, Clark Larson, um, and Zhang Chuanzhou. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. Um, hosted the kickoff conference in 2018 of this Asian module. This builds on earlier work, um, for example, recently an article by Stock et al um, was published and Michael Rivera, who is also commenting on this paper and who is um, also a member of the Asia project, um, contributed very much to this uh, long run paper in PNAS that was recently published and also the team about Jivu Chen who organized this is contributed a lot by collecting a large uh, height data set and also um, a large data set on military fortifications and city development in ancient China. Um, our economic history unit at Tübingen University recently volunteered to do the coordination work of this Asia project and uh, Sun Chao Fan and Wang Chiang came over from China to help us um, with this project and Moritz Kaiser uh, recently joined it. So we have a preliminary sample uh, for China that contains more than 3000 height observations. And how do the height trends, the preliminary height trends look like for China? Well, first of all, um, the Chinese were relatively tall in the ancient period, looking here at, for example, the period between 5000 and 4000 before Common Era or 4000 to 3000 before Common Era, we observe heights of Chinese males um, that were in the range of 166 to 168 centimeters, so that is quite tall by um, historical standards. Um, of course, anthropologists always debate this conversion from long bones, which we really have, femur length, for example, converting that into height. So in the final publication, we will probably only use femur length to show the undisputed part. Um, but just for the illustration here, um, we took three different conversion formulas and averaged them to Chinese conversion formulas and then the traditional Trotter and Gläser method. Um, although recently also newer methods were estimated, which we might also use in the future. 
Um, we put the female heights on the other um, axis. You can see that females were roughly in the range of 155 to 159 centimeters. So that's also by historical standards, a respectable height level. Um, the uh, stock at Isle comparison of different regions found that Europeans, for example, were quite a bit shorter. And that interestingly, also what is today India at the tallest height in this very old period. Um, but let's stick to what we have here. Um, after the year, after the period 500 before Common Era to zero before Common Era, things started to get worse. We see a very dramatic decline, and we also did a statistical significance test. So we see a very strong decline of Chinese height in the period zero to 500 before com uh, Common Era, not before, but Common Era. Um, and then a recovery in what we call in Europe, the early medieval period. Um, in China, it's, uh, for example, in the late period, the Northern Song Dynasty. So there was a strong recovery of Chinese height in this 500 to 1000 common era period. And then a further decline in the uh, 1000 to 1500 period and in the 1500 to, well, this is mostly pre-industrial period, um, let's, let's say 1500 to 1800 period. So the late Ming and the Qing dynasty also had relatively short heights. We can connect that with uh, archi archival data for the 18th century, Stephen Morgan, for example, and his co-authors um, uh, worked on uh, 18th and even 17th century archival written records. And this is roughly in a same similar range of height. Um, the males were a little bit short and the females a little bit taller. But in general, these archaeological and the written records recon confirm each other. So interesting is this period, first of all, the overall decline, what might have been behind it. We don't have a, a final um, view on this yet, but what we would expect is that it's partly the increase of population, which leads to a, a change of the agricultural specialization. Typically in early periods with low population densities, we often have a mixed agriculture that includes both grain, rice later on, and um, animals. So for example, cattle. Um, and later, uh, as population growth is much more difficult to keep the same number of animals per capita because they require some space, especially cattle in northern China require uh, cattle require space. And therefore, there's a switch to a more grain oriented and uh, or rice oriented in the south um, agriculture, which typically leads to less protein per capita. So that would be one hypothesis um, explaining this decline. There are certainly other uh, views like uh, the conflicts, the um, organization of the state. We can discuss a lot of this. I think interesting is also, as we said, this 500 to 1000 recovery of height. Um, that is confirming this case to a certain extent because we had very exceptionally strong pandemics in this period. In Europe, the Justinian plague, we saw a similar increase in this period in Europe of height and animal hyperplasia. Um, that was probably also uh, affect epidemic diseases were also affecting China as well as state collapse in the ninth century, for example. Um, another interesting consideration is whether um, this recovery of nutrition might have had then positive impact on Chinese development because 
<clears throat> this was the period when East Asia very prominently overtook Europe in terms of education and technology, whereas the later period, um, Europe uh, managed to overtake China, at least for a while. Um, and uh, so this period is very interesting to study, and we will give it very much prominence in this project. So turning to gender equality in China, uh, that is something that is very also emotionally um, uh, loaded. So I think that um, if you look into the Chinese literature, you find a lot about sun bias and in a lot of the development economics literature about different Asian countries speaks about the missing women of the late 20th century especially when then um, abortion plays a role and so on. Um, but even before, uh, many uh, girls were not uh, treated um, very well in different regions. And we were curious whether this was a kind of anthropological constant or whether it also changed over time. And the um, bioarchaeological slash economic history methods allow us to uh, trace this for the first time. And what we observe is that in the early periods, there were a lot of periods when females were relatively similar in heights to male. I mean, still there's the biological gap, but within the range of um, tall women, um, relatively short men, or short women, relatively tall men, we see that uh, these indicators tells us that girls received also a lot of high quality nutrients and a good, um, a good treatment when they got ill. But then again, in this period, zero to 500, we see a decline in gender equality, according to this indicator. This has put to be counter checked with under other indicators, of course, and a certain recovery again in the 500 to 1000 period. However, we see a certain continuation of this um, modest level in the what we would call the high and low late medieval period, and then a further decline of <clears throat> gender equality in the last 500 years, which can again be confirmed by archival written records. In fact, we see up to the early 20th century that female human stature was relatively low and male stature was relatively tall uh, in the early 20th century. And then in the 50s, 60s, 70s, the gender equality was in fact rising. There's this paper by Schwegendieck and Baden um, two years ago, which studied this for the 20th century. So we can connect the recent period with this archaeological long-run trends and I think it tells us a lot about um, the societies in the different parts of the world in this case in China. Um, what might have driven gender equality? Again I think ag this agricultural specialization plays a strong role. Um, this mixed agriculture with cattle um, is normally better for females because the main alternative, grain in the north and rice in the south, um, is sometimes benefiting the males. Uh, they have this physiological um, characteristics of relatively strong upper body strength, um, as much of the literature argues, and that gives them a comparative advantage for grain agriculture, the plow is very hard, uh, requires a lot of strength, for example, whereas if you are uh, having a mixed agriculture with animal, cattle and so on, uh, women can also play a very strong role to the, for the household income. They, can, they have much more knowledge about uh, diseases of the animals and how to treat them. They have more um, knowledge in the traditional role. I mean, I'm repeating gender stereotypes here perhaps, but this is how most of these historical societies worked and we can discuss that later. So in this mixed agriculture with cattle, women contributed more to household income and that normally gave them a better 
uh, position and also led to more high quality nutrients given to young girls, uh, roughly equal share for girls and boys. And that might have be the reason for this higher level in the early period and in the uh, early medieval period, um, whereas other periods were more male dominated, dominated, especially the population pressure periods, as we can call them. Coming to the conclusion, we see a long run decline of height over the last 2000 years, and that's actually quite similar to Europe. So China and Europe are in a way very similar in this uh, record. Um, we see an interesting break in the late second millennium, uh, population decline, but also the following educational and technological breakthroughs in China, overtaking Europe. We see a gender equality, which was high in the early period. So that tells us that the sun bias, uh, which often was described as a kind of uh, unchanging characteristic of some Asian societies or so, that's not my view, I'm just citing, um, that was only confined to a very specific period and can be changed easily in the future. And was already changed in the past to a certain extent in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, we can also see a decline in the first millennium common era in this gender equality indicator, um, sorry, um, yeah, gender equality declined. Uh, and in the late, um, sorry, I meant the second millennium, we have first uh, decline and then a very strong decline again in the late Ming, wood binding is another illustration um, of this factor. Taking all these together, yes, we can, um, develop indicators for violence, nutrition, health, and gender equality from the archaeological excavation record. We can find a robust and statistically significant positive relationship for the ancient Middle East between cranial trauma, uh, violence, and animal hyperplasia, poor, health, poor nutrition, and uh, disease. And we interpret this as uh, the role of the state, which was very weak in the beginning, in the Calcolithic period, the second period after the Neolithic, um, when the states were just newly formed and there was a lot of inequality, there was very little uh, legal sophistication, reducing conflicts. But then already the mid, uh, the early and mid Bronze Age saw some reduction of violence and an increase in health and nutrition. And then we, I described you a new project, which is preliminary at the moment, but I think already quite interesting, thanks also to my uh, cooperation partners. Um, we see a decline of height in China and in Europe over the last 2000 years, a recovering during the late first millennium, and we can see that gender equality has a history in China, which is very interesting and dramatic. I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Um, please enter your questions in the, into the Q&A box that you might see on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jörg. Uh, this is a great, uh, presentation of many uh, years of uh, research uh, on other interesting topics. So uh, before uh, we turn to the questions and comments from the audience, uh, let me uh, invite in uh, Michael, uh, Michael Rivera. Mike, oh, I think he may be trying to uh, have the video. Oh, with the camera turned on. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Chen. And thank you so much, Professor Batian, for your talk. Um, my name is Dr. Michael Rivera, and I work at the University of Hong Kong as a um, human evolutionary scientist. And I'll first have a short discussion here with Professor Batian. Um, as someone, you know, deeply interested in studying past, it's really inspiring to see your extensive work conducting 
studies on biological factors such as health or well-being and then contextualizing them with history, you know, accounting for the economic or cultural trends of those uh, of, of different time periods. Um, and so my first question is a bit, bit more broad and, and theoretical. You know, what we're doing is very interdisciplinary. And I'd love to hear your perspectives on what you find scientists learn most from historians and what you think historians learn the most from scientists when you're working together with such you know, broad team of experts. Should I answer directly or do you want to? Uh, yeah, so I should answer directly. I think, um, yeah, there's a lot to be learned fr uh, from scientists, speaking more from the economic history perspective. And I think also um, they have some options of learning from us. I mean, uh, this method um, that was developed um, was uh, certainly first developed in the anthropology, physical anthropology area, which was, of course, part of science, of medical, of human biology um, research. So I think that this is, these are wonderful methods and you can read their texts and they are um, very insightful of, about the many different aspects that are affecting these human biology outcomes. Um, moreover, recently, of course, we see a revolution in other techniques, the ancient DNA technique that also allows us to trace the migration of different people across these millennia, um, still quite um, uh, yeah, resource intensive, you need quite a bit of uh, large grants and so on to do this, but uh, we have, of course, very important um experts doing this and this is a very rich complement also the isotope analysis that allows us to um, measure the composition of the diet whether there was more fish for example um, these kind of things on the other hand scientists certainly can learn from us first of all i think that as social scientists and historians we have a lot of interesting questions we want to know whether uh, societies work in a specific way and um, if I'm talking to uh, uh, scientists coming from natural science they are very curious about how to understand the background of these um, findings that they have and moreover um, I think that the statistics and especially the econometrics approach also allows us to control for a lot of things so typically, uh, a lot of things matter for these things. I could only simplify here in my speech. Um, so using a multiple regression analysis, for example, is very helpful to identify all the different things that might matter for a specific outcome. Absolutely. Um, you just mentioned the genetics uh, work that has been done in the last few decades. Do you have any case studies where, you know, the genetic picture or isotopic picture of migration uh, and population makeup have significantly affected your studies, your studies of impact of diet or disease on height? Because if a group of a certain height into a region where a group pre-exists and has a different average height, it follows they would change the height in that population in that country. So, yeah, any case studies from looking at that? No, no, I mean, this is a very important factor. Um, for example, for Europe, uh, there was quite a bit of movement in the early part of the early medieval period when the, the Roman Empire was breaking down and Germanic populations uh, were migrating. I mean, we think nowadays that the share of really people moving was much more limited, but there were some military elites moving and um, they were often of taller height than the Mediterranean populations. Um, interestingly, once we control for their way of doing agriculture, which was much more cattle and in the European case milk intensive, um, we observe that there's no statistical difference anymore between Mediterranean and northern 
German populations. So it's basically their agricultural specialization, which uh, led to their higher height and sometimes also their military um, advantages. Mm -hmm. Let's um, dig into the methods also, because at the beginning of your near the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that there are a lot of things we have to bear in mind with our samples and the methods that we use. Um, you know, when when we in the field estimate height, for those who don't know, we develop these methods by um, looking at how the femur length or humerus length will correlate with height in skeletal collections of known height. And then we develop equations where you can insert a bone measure and then see a height estimation with a certain reliability. Um, and then so those lately in bioarchaeology and forensics are trying to refine these methods. So you would have equations developed specifically for populations like Scandinavian females or Southern Italian young adults or um, African-American males of a certain height, uh, of a certain age, sorry. And so, uh, and also when you combine multiple bones together, not just using the femur, it can increase the reliability if you have the equations to do that. Um, so professor, you mentioned the standardization of methods. I'm just curious what you think about where we're headed in the future, standardizing which equations we use. Because of course, the more refined, the better, but then they have less applicability to all the populations that we have in a data set. Yeah, I think for this, this is very crucial that we are cooperating. I mean, the anthropologists are very much making progress in these equations, and um, they are. This is basically uh, uh, their field. Um, so I'm don't want to invade in uh, too many other fields. Um, so I think it's very important that we cooperate about this and take the best and most recent and most convincing um, formula that can be used for all these long bones um, to, if we are interested in the final height. I mean, my um, interest in this field is basically to measure the development of um, nutrition and health. Um, and for this, actually, I'm completely satisfied with observing that 300 long bones of the first half millennium um, are much shorter than another 500 femur uh, bones based on the period just before that to see, yes, there's something dramatic happening and from our economic history and economics perspective, we want to know what is happening there and why is that caused. And then we can, of course, also cooperate to find out how the height was really so that people have a more clear imagination of how tall these people were and so on. I mean, that gives us a bit much better intuition than just taking these more abstract measures. Mm -hmm. On, on development, you know, development and the security, state security, state capacity are major themes of your talk today. I'm just wondering, like, what are some of the implications for us looking at the problem of um, development in modern area, uh, in the modern era? Do you think that your work could even have impacts on policy making? Could your findings provide some sort of perspective to those working in public health or public welfare? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's uh, there are very crucial lectures even for today. First of all, um, for we have been looking at very much into this gender equality, also having the implications for gender equality of um, education uh, and the numerical abilities, and that turns out to be a very strong driver of economic development and economic success today. Another direct lecture that we can take from this archaeological record is the um, big burden of conflict on economic development. So I think that's uh, clear that um, this reduces the um, long run development. Um, and I don't want to comment too much on current geopolitics, but uh, I think everybody can uh, look at this historical record and draw own conclusions from it. Mm -hmm. And so, like um, you talked about, how security perhaps allowed 
income, the income to grow or development to happen in the Middle East case um, and develop nonviolent ways of resolving disputes. Um, mm -hmm. The possibility is that better incomes result in better institutions and then it's institutions that reduce violence or it could be a bi-directional mechanism is what you yeah. mentioned. Do you have mm -hmm. how we tease that apart or, or figure out the directionality of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think for the um, Middle East at the moment, we um, have to stick to these two possible directions of causality. For Europe, we have, uh, for of the last 2000 years, we have a little bit more comprehensive data already. And there we find that the um, real causal direction was from um, conflict, uh, to economic development, to nutrition and uh, education. We have one study where we could, for example, use the climatic factors um, in Central Asia, uh, which were quite unrelated to European developments. Um, you know, as you know, there are also studies about the climatic factors uh, impacting on Chinese development. But here we look at the impact on European development because there were nomadic people also visiting Europe after the climatic situation in their uh, home region was uh, becoming unbearable. And that gave a push to um, these kind of nomadic invasions. And there we can use them as a what we call in econometrics an instrumental variable approach, which helps us to identify what causes what, whether the, uh, you, you know, this famous hand and egg problem um, that can be to a certain extent be solved because the climatic dryness was really driven by other factors than intra-European conflicts and economic developments. And there we can see that, yes, it was the, uh, conflict driving economic development. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the violence and, you know, what I noticed often with studies about interpersonal violence in the past is that, you know, it's important for us to account for the fact that violence is likely very underrecorded, given mm -hmm. that we're only working with rare cases where human remains are preserved well enough. Um, mm -hmm. that is, what's very interesting about um, what happens after academic work goes out is that once studies are published about violence, news media and popular media might pick up these scientific narratives and they sometimes mm -hmm. overstate the role of violence, conflict. Mm -hmm. They are inherently built to compete, to fight each other for resources without mm -hmm. appreciating the role of trade or cooperation and peacekeeping, community mm -hmm. building. What's your experience been with navigating the narratives told about violence in the past amongst our peers and also the public. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very interesting aspect, yeah. Um, what the uh, uh, journalists and the media make of scholarly results, um, it's sometimes really surprising, yeah. Um, you are, of course, as a journalist, you need to uh, uh, transform this into a story that can be very easily communicated to the general public. And then, I mean, um, you need to simplify it even more. And um, that is certainly something that is very sensitive in this um, politically relevant field as well. Um, my own experiences, I think, were in general positive. I think that there are many journalists uh, who are very much interested in the enough detail, I would say, uh, to uh, transform the thing that you communicate to them into an interesting story that can be consumed by many people who are reading uh, newspapers or looking at television or social media or, media or so. So I think that, uh, but I know, of course, that there are also many, um, yeah, disadvantages and many uh, negative um, transmissions of this kind of, but that was not so much my own experience. Mm 
So um, it's nearly time for the Q and A with the audience. So I'll just give you maybe a, a fun, a fun last thought from me. Um, I was reading some of your earliest work, and I saw that you had already begun, you know, in the early days using different proxies for human development. So you would look at literacy rates or the degree of book production as a in a place indicating something about capital accumulation, right? Or using human stature already um, for human health. And so my question is, you know, if you go back maybe 10 years or 15 years, what about the work that you're doing now? Would have surprised yourself? The conclusions that you're able to come up with, the data sets you're able to have to work with mm -hmm. now, how would have surprised you if you could talk to yourself 10 or 15 yeah. years ago? No, I think that's something that one should ask to uh, oneself. I mean, the surprises in academic research. I mean, I'm fortunately I'm uh, I'm having a lot of these surprises. So that's partly based the fun of research that you look at some developments and then you suddenly see, oh, there's something happening that I never imagined before. Um, so for just to give an example, this gender equality factor, to be honest, I mean, being a male, I did not believe that this was such an important uh, variable in long run development. I thought that was a little bit, well, political correctness and all that, you know. Um, but then looking at this in uh, greater detail and doing all these statistical analyses, I was really surprised how strong the impact of this was. And that is one of the examples, but I think there were many uh, surprises and I like these surprises. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Patin. Um, I'll thank pass you. it on to Professor Chen now. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, so I, 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 especially given that your internet connection is not, uh, it's not so great, huh? but anyway, thank you for your, your questions. Uh, so York, let, let me, uh, uh, read out some questions for you uh, from the uh, Q&A box. Uh, first, uh, uh, from uh, Richard uh, Michael V. Uh, invention of writing was generally uh, linked to the introduction of accounting. Did this enable state, uh, state storage and redistribution of years and areas of surplus to years and areas of uh, famine? Uh, such as uh, you know Joseph's uh, seven lean and seven fat years in ancient Egypt, as well as uh, you know Qin emperor's redistribution between provinces uh, in modern in the modern era. Mm -hmm. No, that's a very important point. I mean, the state was also very active in uh, flattening the consumption possibilities by, for example, um, putting up storages. I mean, often the emperor and the uh, imperial bureaucracy had a viewpoint from the large cities and they were of course much less interested or informed about what was happening in the periphery in the little farms and so on um, i mean for the state traditionally grain was always more important for example so have some basic nutrition at least in the large cities Whereas in the small farms, they had, uh, for example, these mixed agricultural income. And uh, so there are limits to what we can learn from these um, uh, writings of the state bureaucracy. But I think, especially for the urban population, it's very important. And I like your reminder of Joseph's uh, seven lean and fat years. I think that's um, also very important for China. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, for, um, you know, when you showed the decline uh, from the 10th century to uh, uh, the early 20th century uh, for uh, gender equality uh, in terms of uh, height, uh, it may have been uh, a re partly at least a result of the uh, strengthening impact of uh, Confucian uh, norms, uh, you know, Confucian norms really uh, uh, treat uh, women much more unfavorably than men. Uh, but before the 10th century, uh, the impact of specific uh, gender-related uh, Confucian norms uh, was not so much sort of uh, brought uh, 
to the uh, grassroots uh, level, mm -hmm. level. Uh, but um, there were several major changes in yeah. the Song Dynasty, in the, you know, like especially in the 11th century, that made uh, the gender uh, biases much more pronounced uh, in the larger society. Uh, so let me uh, uh, take the next question from uh, also Richard McAvee. Um, isn't there a lot of height variation within China? That is, uh, Northern Chinese are uh, generally taller than uh, mm. Southern Chinese. Uh, by the way, yeah, I'm, I'm from the South, so <laughs> uh, I'm on the less favored uh, side of things, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the South is wonderful and uh, has so many advantages and a very dynamic development nowadays. Uh, no, of course, there are strong differences, the North-South difference, and I think uh, also with a cooperation within our Asia project, Michael Rivera, for example, already um, um, is looking forward to look at all a lot of different regional differences. These are things that we definitely need to take into account and part of the decline uh, can be certainly also um, be related to north-south differences. We know that the, uh, there was this strong expansion towards the south, the population shifted uh, partly to the south and uh, was more dependent on rice agriculture and um, as population grew the um, animal protein contribution certainly was then also lower, yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, the, the next question is from uh, Matthew uh, Norlert. Uh, what does the distribution of observations uh, over the different periods look like uh, in both uh, Middle East and China? Uh, such, a, for example, how skewed is it toward the uh, later and more recent uh, periods? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's very important to look at the number of observations. Um, we have uh, for the China we have for China we have the situation that we have actually more excavations for the early period because the archaeologists were very keen on identifying well the early Chinese um, since when were certain Chinese characteristics in skeletons observable and so on. Um, only recently we received more excavations and more evidence on the last 2000 years. So this we need, we would love to have more recent evidence. And then we have, of course, a big jump as soon as the written records appear. So, um, for example, for the 18th century, Stephen Morgan has a large sample for the 19th and 20th century. We have thousands of individuals for the 20th century, especially, of course, we have millions of observations. Um, so for the very recent piece past, there's a strong increase in number of cases. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so next uh, from my colleague, uh, Samuel Chan, have you looked at uh, Theo Brack, uh, uh, worked on extensively by uh, McMahon? in Northern Mesopotamia, which was uh, an important site uh, from the fifth millennium uh, BCE onwards. Uh, there was a series of uh, mass uh, graves of seemingly massacred, uh, of a seemingly massacred uh, group of people uh, aged uh, between 20 and 45, around yeah. 3900 uh, to uh, 3600 uh, BC contemporary mm -hmm. with urban growth and uh, increased internal complexity. Could you also comment on the increased state capacity in Mesopotamia as a cause of uh, group violence? Mm -hmm. No, those are very good questions. Um, no, the Eastern Syria part, including Tel Brak, um, this is uh, really the specialization of my co-author, um, Arkadiusz Arek. Um, he is really an expert on that, and we included basically all the um, sites from uh, this region um, um, because that was very important. For the interpersonal violence trends, we um, include controls or we even exclude the mass massacres because they were obviously 
between group violence. So that's a little bit different from this interpersonal violence that we are mainly interested in this study. Um, but it's an important uh, alternative source of evidence, of course. And yes, there was increased state capacity in Mesopotamia. Um, and uh, we certainly also would argue that this reduced interpersonal violence, so the ability not to kill your neighbors, not to go on the street and hit somebody on the head if you want to have the mobile phone or, well, in the case of ancient Mesopotamia, have some golden uh, objects or so. Um, this reduction of interpersonal violence sometimes also turned into an increased intergroup violence against the outside, so more military violence um, of the Assyrian Empire, for example, against the enemies beyond the borders. Um, that was a, a very common finding, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So next from uh, Wang Li, uh, Wang Li. Uh, so how do you link uh, the institutional changes with uh, the violence and uh, health conditions in this research? I mean, well, we would see that, of course, there are many different institutional changes and in many different fields, but very uh, relevant for us is that the state sometimes uh, manages to reduce violence, to convince people in a very diverse way. I mean, policing is one strategy, but you cannot put a policeman behind every citizen to uh, tell every citizen don't use violence now. So it's really important what happens in the hands of people, whether they agree that using violence is not a good thing and uh, especially religious cults um, were very important also to generate this spirit of reducing violence. Okay, so uh, next from uh, uh, Professor Stephen Morgan, the rapid decline in uh, cranial trauma in Europe coincides with a rapid change in technology of warfare from uh, 1400 in particular, the uh, proliferation of uh, firearms and the rapid improvement in Europe compared with those developed in China during the Song Dynasty and Yuan, Yuan Dynasty. Uh, so that's, uh, that is uh, from the 10th century to the 14th century. That doesn't discount the basic finding, but it does pertain uh, to the rapid decline uh, would a variable to capture warfare technology be useful to include in your estimates? Yeah, no, no, definitely. And uh, actually, just before the presentation, we discussed Jivo Chen's project about using grave goods to assess warfare technology for the different archaeological periods as well. So I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, I think the warfare is an important point, but um, and we need to take into account it into account. <clears throat> but we look at the for Europe, we can look at the various indicators of violence. Um, and it seems that these interpersonal violence trends are very visible in quite different indicators in the killing of rulers, whether, um, for example, a duke or a king was killed in the overall homicide. Uh, and also in this um, cranial trauma. So uh, the trends suggest that while there might be a role for the different weapon technologies, um, the weapon technologies did not change the overall picture of the uh, decline. It's, um, it's basically people can also, of course, kill without weapons some of the most violent uh, societies in per capita terms are uh, have been living in Amazonas Basin, for example, uh, and not using firearms for a long period. Um, so these anthropological studies are also very valuable comparisons for the influence of weapon technology. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So next from uh, Fushan, uh, why not use traditional indicators like uh, urban development, uh, such as uh, population and city size to measure the state capacity? 
I'm very thankful for this question um, because um, I think that um, it's a very important uh, indicator of urban development. But I also have some reservations uh, from my perspective looking from health and nutrition because you often find that uh, in large urban agglomerations, the standard of living was actually worse than in uh, more agricultural, low urbanized societies in the countryside, in the mountains even, you sometimes have the best nutrition. Um, so I th I'm using uh, the urban development as an indicator, and I think that's very important, but I also have some reservation about city growth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry, we're running out of time. Let me take uh, one last question. Huh? This is very uh, a very interesting, uh, unique one from uh, Catherine Austin Barnes. Uh, I was curious whether you had more to say about the goddess of warfare that uh, you pictured uh, in your introduction. While I'm not uh, an Egypt, uh, uh, I'm uh, sorry, Egyptologist. Uh, I recall that uh, the Egyptians had a god, uh, B.E.S., uh, who is the god of both uh, childbirth and warfare. Uh, he is an anomaly, uh, not only for the uh, war-birth combination, because he is showing head-on, uh, most gods were showing in profile, uh, and looks like uh, a, a chubby uh, dwarf uh, lion. Uh -huh. Uh, this gets to my real question. Uh, would an exploration of Egypt uh, data and insights, um, in addition to bones, uh, we have written records, lots of uh, war uh, for higher quality of metals uh, that was uh, extraterritorial, um, probably had the most significant medical uh, treatments. Yeah, no, I think Egypt would be very nice to study in this comparative perspective. And I'm also very thankful for this, bounding this back to Inanna and the uh, cults of Uruk and uh, Mesopotamian goddesses. I think um, a lot of the interesting developments that we observe can be partly also found in these religious developments and which kind of things people put very much into the front of their religious um, activities. I think that this um, ambivalence of Inanna and later Ishtar being both responsible for love and for warfare, and as you say, the Egyptian god who was responsible for childbirth and for warfare, I think that's very nice because um, it also shows how um, yeah, ambivalent these um, developments were and that, for example, state capacity can have positive and negative effects that um, uh, can be also reflected in these cultural um, design of the goddesses and how they are shown in the uh, sculptures and pictures. Okay, so Sorry uh, uh, to the others uh, whose questions cannot be uh, addressed uh, this time because we are we are already out of time. Uh, so again, uh, my uh, thanks to uh, Professor Barton and Dr. Rivera uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation and uh, uh, questions and comments and so on. Of course, uh, you know to all of you who are still with us. Uh, special thanks because you, you not only joined us, but also uh, have stayed on until this point. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so our next uh, uh, talk uh, or webinar is uh, by Professor Joe Mokio, uh, which will be uh, a week from uh, today on uh, March 30th, uh, 2023. So his talk will be on uh, an evolutionary approach to the history of useful knowledge. So please uh, join us. Uh, he is one of uh, the one of a very few uh, scholars uh, who have contributed a lot uh, to economic history, especially uh, the history of uh, economic thoughts and uh, 
um, especially knowledge, uh, useful versus useless knowledge. Okay, so uh, we'll look forward to uh, what uh, he will tell us uh, next week. So again, uh, thanks to uh, all of you. Thank you, especially uh, to Professor Barton. Okay, have a Thank good you. day, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm.